Hey everybody, welcome to Mammoth Interactive's YouTube channel. First of all, I want to thank you for watching this video. And remember that this channel doesn't do Patreon, instead we sell our digital courses down below. And every single dollar that we get from the products you buy below goes into making more content. The best way to help out this channel and Mammoth Interactive is to subscribe to Mammoth Interactive's huge library of content. Get thousands of hours and hundreds of courses for a low, low price down below. We have a monthly option and a yearly option. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the video. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we are going to talk about how to get the Twitter developer API. So how you can access the API because we are going to need to access the API for our project. First, let's talk about what is an API in the first place. API is an initialism for application programming interface. It is a software intermediary, a third-party middleman, and it allows two applications to talk to each other. In our case, it's going to allow our bot application to talk to Twitter. That's the Twitter API is going to be the middleman between the bot and the actual site Twitter. We will use Twitter's API to access Twitter algorithmically via our code, for example, to get a latest tweet from a celebrity. There are other options than just the Twitter API. There's Twitter Ads API, Twitter for Websites, and Twitter Developer Labs if you want to actually do work on the Twitter API yourself to help improve it. With the Twitter API, you can do a whole range of tasks. For example, you can explore a user's tweets. You can fetch their latest tweet. You can listen for events. You can stream tweets in real time. You can measure tweet performance and analyze conversations and more. So let's talk about how we can actually get access to the Twitter developer API. First, you have to have a Twitter account. So you can either use your existing account or create a brand new one. And then you have to apply for a Twitter developer account. So this will link your Twitter account with the Twitter developer site. So you don't actually have two accounts, you have one. You're using your Twitter account to access Twitter developers, but you have to apply. So you just have to write a small application. It will ask you, what are you using the Twitter API for? And you just have to write a few sentences and then you can apply. Typically you'll be approved quite quickly within 24 hours, but it can take up to five days. So just go to developers.twitter.com and hit the button apply for access and there you can submit your application. Then once your application has been approved, you'll be able to access the developer portal. So you'll just be able to access that via your Twitter account that you used. And here you can create projects and apps. And you're just here setting up the projects and apps. You're not actually building them via the developer portal. You're just setting them up because for every app, you're going to have a set of a key and a secret. So you'll have a set of keys and secrets, and these are unique to your app. And they're the way that your app can actually access the API. So they're done via keys and secrets. So inside of projects and apps, create a new project. And in there, you can also create apps per project. So you will need your own unique key and secret pairs to access Twitter's API via your bot, and these shouldn't be shared. As mentioned, create a new project, and under that project, create a new app. Automatically, an API key and secret will be created for you. These are also called the consumer key or the consumer secret. They're the same name, different names for the same thing. All right, so that will be created by default with every app that you create via the developer portal. Next, we also have to create access key and access secret pairs. So we need not only the consumer keys, but we also need the access keys. Those are just below the consumer keys. So to create that second pair, yes, you'll need two pairs. We're going to go to projects and then our app. So click on your app. In this case, my project is called Trading Bot and my app is called Get Tweet. Then click on Keys and Tokens right beside Settings. And this is where you can create an access key 
and an access secret. Just go to the section authentication tokens, access token and secret, and then click generate. Make sure to save those. And then we can use that key and secret double pairings. We have two, we have the consumer and the access pairs. We need both of those. So you'll have four in total. You have a key, a secret, and another key and another secret. We're going to use those to access Twitter's API via our bot, which is our client side application that's going to scrape tweets with the API. So to access the Twitter API via Python specifically, because our bot is written in Python, we'll use the TweetP library. Now you can access the Twitter API via a range of clients. You don't have to use Python, but our bot is written in Python. So that's why we're using the TweetP library. Tweepy allows you to connect your Python client, so your Python app, with the Twitter API, and you do that via your key and secret that you created, those two pairs of keys and secrets that you created for your project. So here's an example. First, you will call tweepy.oauth handler, and here you'll pass in your consumer key and consumer secret. Then you have to set an access token using the access key and the access secret, and that creates your API. So as you can see, you have to use all four. And don't worry, we're going to be doing this in our project together. This is just a preview. All right, and that is how you can access the Twitter developer API. Once you have done all of those steps, you are now ready to start using Twitter's API with your bot. Now make sure you do take those steps to get your four key secret values. You need those consumer key and secret and the access key and secret because this is unique to everyone. So you can't use someone else's. Now we are ready to jump into building our bot. And the first step is going to be to set up Twitter so we can access the Twitter API via our bot. Join me in the next lecture where we will start coding and we'll start using the API. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we are going to get started building our trading bot. Our first step is going to be to get the latest tweet that Elon Musk tweeted. And we're going to do that algorithmically via an API. So that way we can get the latest tweet at any point of the day. We can get it every 10 seconds if we want to. So join me at Google Colab. This is where we'll be building our program. Just go to colab.research.google.com. And as long as you have a Google account, then you can start building out your program here for free. So we're going to code in Python here at Google Colab. All right, next, let's build out our first function. We're going to call this get tweet Elon Musk. All right, so here we've defined our function header. And inside of here, we are going to use the Tweepy API in order to access tweets at any point of the day. So for that, we are going to import Tweepy at the top of this code cell. Just go import Tweepy, and this will allow us to use Tweepy, which is Twitter's scraper module. Okay, so how do we put Tweepy to use? Well, I'm going to instantiate a new cursor object from Tweepy, and this requires several arguments. First, I need to actually instantiate the API. So I'm going to create a variable called API, and I'm going to use tweepy.api here, and I'm going to pass in an authorization of my API. So let's create auth here. We're going to use tweepy.oauth handler. So for that, we do have to import the oauth handler. Just go from tweepy import the OAuth handler. Okay, now in order to put to use this OAuth handler, we have to pass in two arguments. We have to pass in a consumer key and a consumer secret. Now these 
come from the, your Twitter developer account. So make sure you have applied for a Twitter developer account and that you have gotten confirmation of your Twitter developer account. Just go to developer.twitter.com and go to your portal. I can include a link for you here to that. Go to your portal and make sure that you indeed have been accepted for a developer account. This should take less than 24 hours, but can take a few days sometimes. Once you've been accepted, you can then create a new project. So make sure you create a new project for this program. And you'll have consumer key and consumer secret created for you. These are created per project. They are also known as your API key and your API secret. These are unique to you. They're attached to your Twitter developer account. And we're going to use these in order to access Tweepy. So everyone will have their own consumer key and consumer secret per project. And these are created when you create a project. So make sure you define consumer key. So define, enter your API consumer key here. And then also same for consumer secret. Make sure you enter your API consumer secret here because if you don't have these two defined, you won't be able to actually use Tweepy. So you can put these in a separate file. Typically you'll see these variables placed in another file, a secret file, because you don't want anyone else using your key or your secret because it will be logged in your account every time you use your Twitter developer account for some project. Okay, so we have our consumer key and our consumer secret. You replace these with the string that is your consumer key and then also the typically longer string that is your consumer secret. So th these aren't mine, I'm just using some examples for you of what they would look like. Okay, next up, now we have our auth. Afterwards, we're going to have to set our access token. So call auth.set access token. This will require an access key and an access secret. So this is similar to consumer key and consumer secret, but they are a different key and secret. So what you have to do is go to your project you created inside of your Twitter developer account. And under your project, go to keys and tokens, and then you have to generate these. So they're actually not auto generated with the project the access tokens you have to create separately. But it's completely free to create a project and to create access tokens. Okay, so once you've created the access tokens, make sure you save them because they'll only be shown once. And then again, you have to make variables for your access key. So make sure you enter your access key here. And you have to make a variable for your access secret. So make sure you enter your access secret here. And make sure it's also inside of the quotations. For example, it might look something like this, your access secret and your access key. These are strings, so make sure you have them as strings. Okay, great. Next up, we have now set our access token, and that means our API will be ready to use. And we can then, after we have our API, we can Put it to use inside of get tweet Elon Musk. All right, so we're going to use tweepy.cursor. Here we're going to pass in api.user timeline. So we can actually get a user's timeline of tweets. We have to pass in some ID here. We're going to use Elon Musk ID. So let's define that. Elon Musk ID. This is a string and his ID is 44196397. So from Tweepy, we can access Elon Musk's timeline using his account ID. And this is a public ID that anyone can use. Next up, we're going to get since, and we want to get from date.today. So this means we're going to get today's tweets. Now, in order to use date.today, we do have to import the date 
module. So make sure at the top of your file here, you include from date time, we're going to import date. All right, next up, let's continue. What else do we need here for our cursor? We have since, we have ID as well. We need our tweet mode. And we're going to set that to extended in case the tweet is very long. And we want to get our first item, so items one. The result here is going to be our tweets. Next, we have to go through these tweets and we have to remove any invalid characters or non-alphanumeric characters because we want to remove any emojis or dashes. So let's work on that. We're going to get latest tweet and store it here in a processed version using regular expressions or RE. So we do have to import the regular expressions module. Then here we're going to use RE dot sub and here we can specify the regular expression we want so we want to make sure we only allow a to z uppercase or lowercase and also zero to nine and make sure you close that and it can be of any length here make sure that the single quote there or double quote doesn't matter is here outside of the actual expression Okay, and then we're going to replace any non-accepted characters with just a space. And here we're going to call our tweet.fulltext for every tweet in our tweets, because tweets is an iterable object. All right, and next we're going to check that it actually worked using a while loop. So while not the latest tweet, if we don't have latest tweet, then we want to make sure we keep calling the API until we do get it because sometimes the Tweepy API will fail to return a tweet. So just copy this code and paste it again because sometimes it does indeed fail. So we'll only enter this loop if latest tweet is null and we'll get latest tweet again or we'll try if it fails again then the loop will just try again and we'll just keep trying until we manage to get a latest tweet but api doesn't often fail but that's just to cover our bases all right then finally we're going to return our latest tweet at index zero and i'm also going to convert it to lowercase to process it now to test this out we can call get tweet elon musk and we can test out our API call. Just make sure you do have all of these variables defined. They must be defined or you won't be able to use the API. Also for this regular expression, make sure all your parentheses line up. So here the sub is actually on this whole list of arguments because we're substituting any kind of non-alphanumeric character with a space. So make sure you have those parentheses lined up properly. And then let's run this code cell. Okay, look here, this is our result. Our result is Elon Musk's latest tweet. Now your result will be different because of course he's been tweeting a lot since the creation of this video. So here we have the latest tweet. Notice that any non-alphanumeric characters have been removed. And also, all the text has been brought to lowercase. And that's because we're going to be processing the tweet for sentiment. We're going to be saying, what is the sentiment of the tweet? If it is talking about a cryptocurrency like Ether, we want to know if Elon Musk is actually tweeting negatively, neutrally, or positively about the crypto, because that will have an effect on the price in a different way. If he's tweeting positively, we're going to assume the price will go up. If he's tweeting negatively, we're going to assume the price will go down. So that's why we need to convert this to lowercase so that we can search for more easily what word is there, making sure that the tweet actually has a cryptocurrency in it because not every tweet is going to be about cryptocurrency. 
Okay, more on that coming up next. So now that we have gotten the latest tweet, we're going to check if it is actually talking about cryptocurrency. This latest tweet is not talking about cryptocurrency, but we're going to write an algorithm to figure out that for us. So join me in the next lecture where we will continue this project. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. Previously, we learned how to get the latest tweet via Twitter's developer API. And next in this lecture, we're going to learn how we can check if the tweet is talking about Ethereum. All right, so for that, let's create another code cell and let's define a function. We can call this our trading bot. So this will be our function that runs on loop. First, we need to call get tweet Elon Musk in order to actually get the latest tweet. So we're using this function. Next, we have to check if this latest tweet is talking about Bitcoin. So we'll check if any keyword in the latest tweet exists for every keyword in our keywords. So we have to define a keywords list that is going to be relevant to the cryptocurrency. So let's define here our keywords. We're going to use here ETH and Ether, Ethereum. We could also include Solidity. And often it's also good to include misspellings as well. For example, I'm going to include some misspellings here of Ethereum, just because often tweets can be misspelled. So you want to account for these variations. And let's see, we have here Ethereum. What else could be misspelled? Ethereum. And let's also include EVM, which is short for Ethereum Virtual Machine. Okay, so here we have our list of keywords. So if the tweet contains any of these words, then we'll consider that the tweet contained something about Ethereum. And then we'll have to check if there was a positive sentiment, then that means we want to buy Ethereum because we expect that the price will go up. If there's a negative or a neutral sentiment, then we could either do nothing or we could also sell our Ethereum as well if we wanted to. Okay, and that's a simple strategy that we can implement for this bot. Of course, there are more nuanced strategies that we could implement after as well. So we're going to check if our latest tweet contains any of the keywords. And if it does, then, well, we're going to analyze sentiment. But for now, let's just print here. The tweet was about ETH. Otherwise, let's use an else statement and we'll print here. The tweet was not about ETH. All right, and let's now run this code cell. And let's see, oh, we do have to call it trading bot if we want it to actually execute. So just make sure you have a call to the function. Otherwise, we just defined it, but we didn't actually call it. So let's run this and look at that. We got a result. The tweet was not about ETH. That's because our latest tweet was tanks for the memory Panzer of the Lake, but that doesn't contain any of the keywords. We could, for example, try something else just as an example. We could put the latest free be I love ETH. And now if I rerun this, look at that. We get the tweet was about ETH. Reason being, it contains this keyword ETH. All right, so that proves that our strategy here works for checking if a tweet is about ETH. If the tweet contains any of these words, then we'll consider it to be, have been about ETH. Now, what we're going to do is execute this trading bot every minute, for example, or even every few seconds, but that will be later on. So that way, throughout the whole day, we can check if there was a tweet if there was a new tweet and if that new tweet was about ETH. Okay, coming up, we are going to analyze our tweet for sentiment. 
So we have to check, was the tweet positive or negative if it was about ETH? For example, let's say the tweet was, I love ETH. In that case, it has a positive sentiment. So we're going to assume for this trading strategy that the price of ETH would go up because that has been the trend. But if something like I hate ETH is what Elon tweets, then we're going to assume for the strategy that the price will go down because that has been the case in the past. So it's been the historical trend. And then again, there could be something neutral as well, just ETH. And in that case, we would predict that the price would go up just based on history. But in that case, it'd be up to you. You could choose whether you wanted to buy, sell, or hold. So that is what we're going to work on next. We're going to analyze the sentiment. We're going to be able to figure out, is this tweet positive, neutral, or negative? And we're going to use sentiment analysis to do that algorithmically. So join me in our next lecture. We're going to start a new section where we will learn how to analyze sentiment. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. Coming up next for our bot, we have to take the tweet that we scraped and we have to analyze it. Specifically, we need to analyze, is the tweet positive, neutral, or negative? What is the sentiment? Because if Elon tweets positively about a crypto like Ether, then Historically, that has been shown that the value of the crypto will go up. But if he tweets negatively, that has shown historically that the value will go down. So we can't just get a tweet and say, oh, Elon tweeted about Ether. We have to actually know what was the sentiment? Was it positive? Was it negative? Was it neutral? So that is what we're going to do next. First, we're going to talk about what is sentiment analysis and how you can actually do it. Then we'll go back to our bot and we'll perform sentiment analysis on tweets. All right, so let's talk about sentiment. What is the sentiment of the following sentences? We have, I love Bitcoin, I hate Bitcoin, and what is Bitcoin? Three different sentences and three different sentiments. Starting off, I love Bitcoin. This has a positive sentiment. It means the person who wrote the sentence or who said the sentence they had a positive feeling about the subject matter. The subject matter could be anything, but it's unique to the sentence. In this sentence, the subject matter is Bitcoin. So the writer of that sentence had a positive sentiment about Bitcoin. That's why we say the sentence has a positive sentiment. This is commonly done for scraping and analyzing reviews for example, reviews of a movie or of a product or of a restaurant or comments on videos, etc. All of those kinds of applications, websites, they use sentiment analysis in order to determine the reaction of an audience. Did they like this video? Should we recommend this video as well? For example, did they like this restaurant? Did they not like this restaurant? Do they like this movie, etc. So big companies and small companies, depending on their budget, they will use sentiment analysis to get user feedback because you could read every review yourself, but that takes a long time. And if you're a huge company and you're getting a lot of reviews, you need to know with a data analysis perspective, what is the sentiment of the recent product you released? And to do that quickly and also to do it in a way that you can trust, we use sentiment analysis because it's an algorithmic way to get sentiment from your customers. And this can really inform what products you should release next, if you should keep investing in that product, etc. Sentiment analysis is also commonly used in finance and for stocks because, for example, you could scrape the news, scrape the web, scrape Twitter, and find out what's the sentiment of a company or what's the sentiment of a stock and therefore help you determine, should I invest in this stock or is there a lot of negative press about it and will it plummet soon? All right, so in this sentence, I love Bitcoin, that has a positive sentiment. So therefore, if you saw a lot of these, an overwhelming amount during your sentiment analysis phase of a stock like Bitcoin, then that means that you would probably invest in it because there's a lot of positive sentiment. So 
it's predicted to go up. As well, we say that the polarity of this sentence is greater than zero. So polarity is a numerical way of expressing positive sentiment. So instead of saying positive, we say greater than zero. Next, the sentence, I hate Bitcoin. This has a negative sentiment because we have that word hate, which has strong negative associations. So that's why we say this has a negative sentiment. And when I say we say, it's not a me, it's actually whatever algorithm you're using, whether that's an algorithm you built yourself or an API or a machine learning model or statistics, whatever kind of analysis you're using to process those words. And the result will be that the sentence has negative sentiment. The person who wrote that sentence or who said that, they have a negative feeling about their subject matter, Bitcoin. We also say that the polarity is less than zero because it's a negative polarity. Then we have what is Bitcoin? This is a neutral sentiment because it's neither positive or negative. So yes, you can have neutral sentiments as well. The polarity here is stated to be zero. All right, so sentiment analysis, as we saw, it works with textual data, speech, and that's why it's part of the natural language processing. And let's talk about natural language processing. This is the branch of artificial intelligence for working with any kind of textual data or words, whether that's spoken or written down, natural language processing can handle it. All right, so natural language processing deals with the interaction between computers and humans using natural languages like English, French, not computer language like JavaScript. The goal of natural language processing is to read and understand human languages, not by people, but by computers. So you're training an algorithm to read and understand. Natural language processing is a huge branch. It's used very commonly for all sorts of tasks like translating, for example, Google Translate, or even better, deep translations with deep neural networks. As well, it's used for speech to text, for captioning, and it can even be used to read. So for example, if you're training a model to read and understand actually what's being written. So when it reads cat, it actually knows what you're referring to because you can teach it how to understand its context. There's a lot about natural language processing you could go into. For our purposes, we're just working with a small subset of it. The small subset being that sentiment analysis portion, but there's a huge, huge range of different natural language processing aspects. The goal is just to read and understand human language. With sentiment analysis, we are looking at a piece of text, typically some kind of review, and we're trying to classify if the writer likes or dislikes the subject matter. How does this work? Well, there are many different applications and ways to do sentiment analysis, all the way from just probability to machine learning, neural networks. There's a wide range of techniques that you could use, that you could even invent. Let's talk about one way. One way is to find how probable liked or disliked words are. For example, the word love is more of a positive sentiment. It's more of a liked word, meaning if that appears in a sentence, you can better say that this sentence has a positive sentiment because love is a positive word. But if you have a lot of negative words like hate or dislike in your sentence, the more of those, the more probable it is that the sentence has a negative sentiment. So you can count the frequency that liked and disliked words appear in a text. And then you can sum over all the probabilities in both categories because a sentence could have both liked and disliked words. A sentence could have love and hate. And you could weigh how much liked or disliked the text is based on that. This is just one probabilistic technique of sentiment analysis. There are others. This is just one example to show you how it can work. All right, so for us to analyze our tweets for sentiment, we are going to be using the text blob library. 
This is a helper library that has sentiment analysis tools, so we don't have to write it all from scratch, but you could write it from scratch, or you could even use Twitter's API. You could use other APIs and other libraries. There are many different techniques for sentiment analysis. Text blob is really easy and straightforward. That's why we're using it. It's a simple API that can process textual data like a tweet. It also does have support for other natural language processing tasks. For example, part of speech tagging, you can find this is a noun, this is a verb. Noun phrase extraction, you can grab cities, etc. Sentiment analysis, as well as the point that we're using it for, classification, you can classify and translate and much more. So text blob is a very popular library. And very simple, as you can see, here's just an example of text blob for analyzing sentiment. You just import text blob in your Python project if you're using Colab, and you instantiate a new text blob using your tweet. And just like that, from that blob, you can get the sentiment polarity. If the polarity is positive, that means the tweet was positive in terms of its sentiment about its subject matter. If the polarity is negative, the tweet was negative. If the polarity was zero, the tweet was neutral. And there we go, just like that, we can use tweet blob. All right, that is sentiment analysis. Coming up, we're going back into our collab project, back to our bot, and we are going to use sentiment analysis in order to analyze Elon's tweets. So join me in our next lecture where we will work on that. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. Coming up, we are going back into our collab project, continuing on building our trading bot. Now that we have scraped our latest tweet and we've checked whether or not it's about ETH, coming up, we're going to analyze the tweet for sentiment because it's not enough to just know what the tweet contains. We also have to know was the tweet positive or negative or neutral? Because that is going to inform what is going to happen to the value of the crypto. So let's create here another function call. I'm going to call this analyze sentiment. All right, and then let's define analyze sentiment. Remember, trading bot is our main function. Then we need some helper functions like analyzing sentiment and buying crypto. Okay, so how do we analyze the sentiment of a sentence? For this, we're going to use the text blob module. So first let's define analyze sentiment and we are going to need to use text blob. So from text blob, import the text blob class. This is going to allow us to grab the sentiment of a tweet. So instead of doing it all from scratch, we can just use this helper module. First, we have to pass to analyze sentiment, the latest tweet. So you could either pass that as an argument or you could just call get tweet Elon Musk as well. Doesn't matter. And so let's first grab the latest tweet. We can just redeclare it here. So we have our latest tweet. Then we're going to pass that to text blob. So text blob will take in latest tweet because text blob, it takes in a string. So we've passed it latest tweet. This is going to return a tweet blob. And I'm going to then be able to access its sentiment and the polarity. For example, we can print out here our tweet blob dot sentiment. So we can test this out. Let's just copy this into a new cell temporarily and then let's call analyze sentiment and we'll see what's printed out here. Oh, we do have to copy that import statement as well because if I ran this code cell, but I didn't run the previous code cell, then the previous code cell won't actually be executed if I haven't run it. Okay, so I'm going to run this code cell and look at this. I get a sentiment object returned. 
This sentiment object has two values, polarity and subjectivity. So polarity, this refers to negative, positive, or neutral. We could change this to something like, I love ETH instead. Then if we rerun this, look at that. Our polarity, instead of being zero, our polarity is now 0 0.5 and our subjectivity 0 0.6. Let's say we did something like I hate ETH. Look at that. Our polarity is now negative 0 0.8 and our subjectivity is 0 0.9. So if we have negative polarity, that means the tweet has negative sentiment or in other words, the person who wrote that tweet was feeling negatively about the subject matter. That's what we mean by sentiment. If polarity is positive, that means that the person who wrote the tweet has a positive sentiment or a positive feeling about the subject matter, which is ETH in this case. But it could be any subject matter. It could be I love dogs, and we could still get the sentiment. Now let's say we did something like I love ETH so much, it is my favorite crypto, so just adding a longer tweet here. I like Ether. Then let's rerun this and okay, our polarity subjectivity hasn't changed that much. If we did I hate ETH, it is the worst, terrible. Let's try that. Okay, now we have polarity negative 0 0.9 and our subjectivity 0 0.97. So note here that your polarity will go to a higher absolute value, meaning more negative or more positive, if you add more of a description here, but your subjectivity is more variable. Okay, so for our example, we're going to be using not just any string, but specifically the latest tweet from Elon Musk. Currently, the polarity is zero, which means completely neutral, just because my latest tweet was tanks for the memory panzer of the lake, which is quite neutral. So that's why we're getting 0, 0.0 here. Okay, and next, we don't want to return just the sentiment object. We want to get this polarity value. So for that, all we have to do is return here our tweet blob dot sentiment dot polarity. So we can actually just access here dot sentiment dot polarity. We can print out that value instead just to make sure it works. So let's print tweet blob dot sentiment dot polarity. Okay, so there we go. We get 0 0.0, 0, 0, 0.0 just because I called analyze sentiment. Let's say I didn't print it. I would still get a result just because I called it and that's how Google Colab works. Okay, so we have analyzed sentiment all set up. Let's just copy that and we can remove this code cell. It was just for testing and we'll paste in that code that we just wrote here. Don't forget the import statement though as well. Okay, so now we have our function that is going to analyze the sentiment of our tweet and we're going to use that here inside of our trading bot function. So we're going to use analyze sentiment. How are we going to use it though? Well, we're going to get a result here of our polarity. So we can store this as the polarity. We'll just make this variable and we'll store the result of analyze sentiment. This is going to be a float value. So we'll have decimal places. Then we can check if polarity, you can use parentheses, you don't have to, if polarity is greater than zero, what does that mean? It means that the tweet had a positive sentiment about its subject matter. So that means Elon tweeted about ETH in a positive manner. So we can print out here that Elon tweeted positively about ETH. In this case, we would want to buy some ETH for our strategy. It depends on your strategy, but we can have a simple strategy where we buy if the sentiment is positive and we don't do anything if the sentiment is neutral or negative. Or we could also sell if the sentiment is negative. So in this case, now we know that the tweet was about ETH and that we would know when it was positive. 
We can also include an else statement. So if the polarity was neutral or negative, we can print out here, Elon tweeted negatively about ETH. We could also include, for example, zero if polarity is equal to zero. So we could use else if polarity equals zero. That means Elon tweeted neutrally, not neurally, about ETH. Then we could just have an else statement for any other cases, which is when Elon tweeted negatively about ETH. Also in Python, else if is elif, so just make sure you have elif here. And we can run this code cell. All right, in this case, we get a tweet was not about ETH because our tweet wasn't. But let's say we want to try a different tweet here, such as I love ETH, it is amazing. Well, in this case, let's pass our latest tweet to analyze sentiment just so that we don't forget that it was changed. And inside of analyze sentiment, we'll just pass it as an argument instead of recreating it. Then we can rerun our code cell. Okay, this time we get the tweet was about ETH and Elon tweeted positively about ETH. That is correct. Let's try I hate ETH this time. And look at that now, we get the tweet was about ETH and Elon tweeted negatively about ETH. What if we just simply had ETH in this case? Okay, yep, the tweet was about ETH and Elon tweeted neutrally about ETH. All right, so that means our text blob is working nicely. It can see and tell me when the tweet was positive, when the tweet was neutral, and when the tweet was negative. Let's just put this back to our function call to get tweet Elon Musk. So that way we're always going to be using the latest tweet by Elon Musk. Awesome, now that we have analyzed tweet sentiment, we can now set up our trading. So if polarity was positive, the simplest strategy is to then buy ETH because we predict that the price will go up if the sentiment was positive. So next up, we're going to start another section. We'll continue this project and we are going to learn how we can buy cryptocurrency algorithmically. So our bot is going to now start buying crypto. And first we're going to do this with some test crypto using a sandbox. Then I'm going to show you how you can do it with your actual Coinbase account with real coins. Join me in our next section where we will continue this project. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. The next step of building our bot is going to be to learn how we can buy some crypto algorithmically. First, we're going to do that with fake crypto so you can test your bot before you deploy it. So to learn how to do that, we are going to learn how we can get the Coinbase Pro Sandbox API, how we can access that API to do a sort a whole range of tasks like buying crypto, you could sell crypto, trade it, etc. So let's jump in. What is the Coinbase Pro Sandbox? This is a testing environment where you can test your API connectivity. You can test that you actually connected to the API. You can also test your web trading. So like I said, buying, selling, exchanging your crypto. You can also add unlimited fake funds for testing. So you can have a bank account of a million dollars or a thousand Bitcoin and you can test with that. So it's for testing your bot, which we want to do before we deploy it. Login sessions and API keys are separate from production, so you won't be using your real Coinbase account. That's coming a bit later in the course, but first we're going to test our bot before we use it. So these are separate API keys that we're going to create. There are separate keys for the sandbox versus for the real thing. And we are going to use the sandbox web interface, the sandbox site, to create keys in the sandbox environment. There are many client libraries that integrate with Coinbase Pro Sandbox. We're using Python for our bot, but it does also support Haskell, Java, Rust, C Sharp, Node.js, GDAX, Ruby, and Go and more as the days go on. Every profile in the Coinbase Pro Sandbox is the same as a profile on Coinbase Pro. 
So the techniques for trading, buying on the sandbox are very similar for trading, buying on the real deal on Coinbase. So practicing on the sandbox is going to be helpful for you before you actually buy on Coinbase. API keys are scoped to a specific profile. So you don't want to share your keys. It's less risky because it is a sandbox, but still you don't want to share your keys. And each API key can only create and view its own data. So you're not touching anyone else's sandbox. You have your own sandbox for your app and you can track all the deposits, all the withdrawals, all the transactions. You can either do trades on a sandbox right there on the website, or you can do it algorithmically via a bot, which is what we're going to do. All right, so to access the API, how do we actually get the API access? Well, first you have to create an account at public.sandbox.pro.coinbase.com. So just at the official website for Coinbase Pro Sandbox. And it's completely free to make an account. You don't need any real coins, any real money. You can just create an account for free. So you first need a Coinbase account to sign up to then Coinbase Pro. And once you've signed up to Coinbase Pro, go to your profile and go to the tab API. And here at API settings, we are going to be able to create a new API key. So hit that button, new API key, and this will create a key, a secret, and a passphrase. So you need three different things for your app. Make sure you save these because you can see them again, but you just have to do verification. It's a bit tedious. So save that key, secret, and passphrase. These are unique to this app. And you can have multiple keys for different apps. We will use this key, secret, and passphrase, all of those, to access the API via our trading bot. Next, you can set up fake funds inside of your Coinbase account. So you can just hit deposit and deposit USD as well as Bitcoin. I'll show you how to do that shortly. And so you can just have fake funds to work with in the sandbox. That way you can start purchasing Bitcoin with USD. You can purchase Ether with Bitcoin via our bot. More on that later. To set up fake funds, it's completely free. You just go to your portfolios and you can deposit your fake currency in crypto. That is the best way to deposit some funds because it will happen instantly into that sandbox. And now that we're ready, we can use the API in our bot to buy crypto. There are several supported currencies for the Coinbase Pro Sandbox. You can see them all at apipublic.sandbox.pro.coinbase.com slash products. So just the site for Coinbase Pro Sandbox slash products. You can see all the supported currencies like Bitcoin, Ether, Bitcoin, and etc. All right, and that is how you can get access to the Coinbase Pro Sandbox API. Make sure that you follow all the steps. You create your account and you create your key secret and passphrase and you deposit funds. And once you've gotten your key secret and passphrase, then you are ready. We can move on to our next step. Our next step is going to be to open up a new sandbox client via our bot. And then we can start doing performing actions like buying ether via the bot. So instead of doing it via the site, we can do it via the bot and the buying of something like ether via your bot that will happen instantly. All right. So join me in our next lecture. We'll go back into our project and start accessing the API via code. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we are going back to our Google Colab, back into our trading bot project. The next step of our project is learning how to buy cryptocurrency algorithmically. First, we're going to learn how we can use a sandbox, the Coinbase Pro sandbox account to buy fake crypto because often you'll want to test your bot 
with some free fake crypto before you actually use your bot in the real world and you start losing or buying your crypto. So that's why I want to show you how you can use a Sandbox account first. The first step is to actually open a Sandbox account via the API here in our code. So for that, let's hop back into our project. I'm just going to move our trading bot function because it's the last function. So I'm going to put it into a separate code cell. And here, let's make a new code cell, to separate our code here. It'll be a bit cleaner. And I want to define a function called open my Coinbase account. And in this case, I'm opening my sandbox account. So we can say open Coinbase sandbox. All right, and what we want to do here is to get our Coinbase Sandbox account algorithmically. So everyone will have their own Coinbase Pro Sandbox account. It's connected to your real Coinbase account. So how do we actually get that account? All right, well, for this, first, inside of this cell, we have to call pip install Coinbase Pro. So use the exclamation mark to enter the console. Then call pip install Coinbase Pro, CB Pro for short. And then call import CB Pro. And you can do that inside of its own code cell if you'd like. That way you won't have to do it every time you run the function. So here we are installing Coinbase Pro so we can actually use its API. Don't worry about all these errors. It's just doing the installation process. It'll also install some helper modules. Okay, and just make sure you call import CB Pro by its proper name, not C Bro, but CB Pro. Okay, great. So once you've imported it, then you can actually use it. So you have to install and import. Okay, now we can put CB Pro to use. And we're actually going to do this outside of the function because we're going to need our account across multiple functions. So call CB Pro, and we're going to use the object known as authenticated client. So here I'm instantiating a new authenticated client, and this is how I can connect to my Coinbase Pro Sandbox account. I have to pass in several arguments here, my API key and my API secret first. These are unique to me and you'll have your own as well. Then as well, your API passphrase and your API URL. The API URL, that is common to everyone. The result of this is going to be a client. So let me show you what these are. API key, this is unique to you. So it's a string and it's typically a series of letters and lowercase, lowercase letters and numbers. So make sure you insert your Coinbase Pro Sandbox API key here because we're just doing the Sandbox. We're not doing Coinbase Pro yet. That's coming up next. First, I'm going to show you how we can use the Sandbox to test before we actually deploy. Okay, then we have API secret. Again, this is personal to you. It'll be longer than the key, but it's the same thing. It's just a series of letters and numbers. So again, you have to insert your Coinbase Pro Sandbox API secret here. So if you go to your Coinbase Pro account, Coinbase Pro Sandbox to be specific, then there you can just create a new pair of key and a secret for free. As well, you'll have a passphrase and make sure you save all of these because it won't show it to you twice. Well, Actually, you can see it twice. You just have to do verification. Okay, and then we have our pass phrase. So you have to insert your Coinbase Pro Sandbox pass phrase here. This pass phrase is unique to this key and secret pairing. Okay, so these three are what you need. So quite a lot, yes, but I want you to be secure. Okay, so these are the three things you need every time you want to make a client. Okay, and we also need API URL, but this is public. This is a string HTTPS forward slash forward slash API dash public 
.sandbox.pro.coinbase.com. So this is the link to actually connect. And you can visit this. It's just not a real website. It's just the link to access the API to connect you to the back end. Okay, so now we have a client. This is a global variable client. Next, I want to use that client across multiple functions, starting with open Coinbase Sandbox. Because it's a global variable that I've instantiated, I have to refer to it as global client if I actually want to change it here inside of open Coinbase Sandbox. Otherwise, it's read only because it's a global variable. It's not created inside of a function. But if I want to change it inside of a function, I have to use this global client to refer to it the first time, not any other time. All right, then following that, whenever you want to open up your bot, you need to start with a sandbox. And the sandbox doesn't have any money in it by default. So when I open this account algorithmically, I want to deposit some money into it. For example, let's say I only want to run the trading bot on Mondays. Then every Monday I'll open up my program, hit run, and I need to algorithmically open my sandbox and deposit some money into it. And then the bot will start running with that money. If I'm using my actual Coinbase account, it's a different story. I mean, you still want to make sure there's some money in there, but you could also just buy Bitcoin directly via your account. So it's different for the sandbox versus for your actual Coinbase account. But first things first, we have to put some money into this Coinbase account. You can also just do this right inside of your account on the Coinbase Pro website. You can just put money into your sandbox account completely free, by the way, because it's a sandbox account. It's not actually buying you any real ether. If you put money into your real account, that's real money. But for the sandbox, you can put money up to a limit and it's just fake money. So we are going to do that algorithmically. But of course, you can do it via Coinbase Pro as well. Just note that there is a bit of a waiting time before the money gets deposited. Okay, how do we do it algorithmically though? We're going to here have to call our client, that object, and we're going to use the deposit function. This will deposit some money into my sandbox account. So that way I can use that money in order to buy my coin. So if I want to buy my coin, I have to actually have some money in my account for the sandbox. So let's deposit some money in there in just USD. Then we can use that to buy coins. How much do I want to buy? Deposit, let's say we want to deposit 10,000. So let's make a variable for this just so it's clear what that is. This is our money to deposit. We'll instantiate that to 10,000. Remember, it's not real money. It's just the sandbox for now, just for testing the bot. Then we need to pass in our currency. So let's define what currency we want to use. And for that, I'm going to here just use USD. Make sure that the currency is in all caps here, USD. Otherwise, your return value of this deposit is going to be not found currency. And finally, we also need a payment method ID here. This is our last argument. So let's define a payment method ID inside of open Coinbase sandbox here. First, I'm going to grab all of the available payment methods from my client. So I'll take the client and I'll use the function get payment methods. This is going to return for me the payment methods that the client has. Because it's just a sandbox client, we have different payment methods set up by the sandbox. There's a bank account that the sandbox has. And this allows you to deposit funds from that bank account to your sandbox Coinbase account completely for free. And it's fake money. It's not real money. That is going to be our payment method. So first, we're going to get all the payment methods available. And then we have to find the payment method appropriate for depositing USD currency. Because that's different from if we were trying to deposit something like Bitcoin, we would use a different payment method. All right, so 
for our USD. We're going to loop for every method in payment methods. We'll get all the available methods and we are going to here grab currency by using method.get currency or a value of none. So this means we're getting the methods currency. This could be USD or another currency. Then we'll check if the currency dot upper is equal to USD. This will account for upper or lower casing. And if that's the case, then our method ID is going to equal method dot get our ID or it will equal none. So here we're going to get the payment method ID for the USD currency payment method. We don't want any other payment method because then we won't be able to deposit USD specifically. So that payment method is going to be the ID that we need. Now you may be wondering what if we can't find USD? Well, let's use an else statement to account for that. So or an L if L if currency is none. That's what really what we want to check. If the currency is none, we'll just continue. The reason being that we have to find USD. We can't use a different currency. All right. And that is going to allow us to perform a deposit. All right. So the result of this is going to be a deposit variable that we could just paste to verify that we are able to perform the deposit. And then we can print out deposit. Then let's run this code cell and I'm just going to make sure as well to comment out this API key, API secret and API passphrase just because I have them declared elsewhere but just make sure that you have indeed declared your API key, your secret and your passphrase otherwise you won't be able to create that client. Then we can rerun the code cell and there we have it. Okay, our result is the ID of the transaction, not of the account. So this will be different each time you run the code cell. We have the amount that we deposited and the currency USD and the payout at, but this is not the correct date. This is just a default date from the sandbox. It's much, much later than 2015. All right, so just like that, we've been able to do the deposit. Make sure you have this exact message because for example, if you try to deposit the wrong currency, if you don't capitalize it, you'll get a message like invalid account, unsupported currency. And that means you weren't able to actually perform the deposit. So make sure you have this message result that shows you the deposit ID, the amount, the currency, and the sandbox payout date not a real payout date because this isn't actual money. This is just money from the sandbox bank account that anyone can access and it's just fake currency. Now in my Coinbase Pro, if I go into my account here, this is the sandbox by the way, not my real account. This is the sandbox account. We can see we have our balances and the United States dollar, which we just deposited. Mine actually hasn't changed. But if you go to deposits, then you can see that it's still pending. All right, so that's why you won't see it show up automatically. If you want to just deposit your money directly right here inside of Coinbase Pro, you can do that. It's going to process immediately. So you just hit deposit. Then you select what you want to deposit, for example, USD. Then select Coinbase.com and just so select how much money you want to deposit. You can hit max to do the maximum. Note that this isn't actual real money from your Coinbase. This is just from Coinbase's sandbox. All right, so feel free to deposit as much as you want here. Hit deposit and the deposit is going to be complete and that happened instantly. So you can feel free to deposit that way as well to the sandbox. You can do the same for a coin like Bitcoin. You can buy Bitcoin from Coinbase.com. Just make sure you select from Coinbase.com Otherwise, the deposits won't work here in the sandbox. Again, you can hit max or just enter an amount. This is from Coinbase.com, not from your actual account. It's from the sandbox. So it's not real currency. You're depositing 50 fake Bitcoin from Coinbase.com. 
into your sandbox portfolio, hit deposit, and there we go, the deposit is complete. So now we have Bitcoin and USD inside of our account here. And we also have other supported coins that are supported by here Coinbase Sandbox, including currencies like the Euro and the British Pound. And later on, we are going to write our bot so that it can purchase Ether via our Bitcoin because that is the only supported way to algorithmically buy Ether at the moment via Coinbase Sandbox. And so therefore, we're actually going to see this value of Ether change because we're going to purchase Ether algorithmically and we'll see the amount that we buy go up and that will be instant that we won't have to wait for that inside of our deposits here. All right, and in our deposits, we can see these have been completed because we did those instantly here in the sandbox. The algorithmic ones are pending, but that's different for buying Ether via Bitcoin. We'll see that happen instantly because that's not a deposit, that's a market order. So a market order will happen instantly. A deposit will be pending if you do it algorithmically via the sandbox. That's the sandbox, the actual Coinbase Pro non-sandbox version, it works very similarly. But first we need to test our bot via the sandbox before we actually use it with some real crypto. All right, so in this lecture, you learned how to open up your Coinbase sandbox account via our code. You also learned how to deposit funds both algorithmically and as well just directly here at our portfolios. Either option is fine. We have plenty of balance to work with. Remember, it's not real coin. It's just for testing. All right. And now that we have opened up our account, join me in our next lecture where we'll continue our project. And we're going to learn how we can buy Ether algorithmically. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching this course. If you want to watch the rest of the course, the link is down below. Not only we get the access to this course, but you'll get access to a lot of other courses in a huge bundle. And it's on sale today. So buy before the sale ends. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in another video.